Thanks for being here, everybody. Um, I'm on the organizing team for Alder Commons, which is the host of this event. We're a nonprofit membership-based community center in Northeast Portland. Uh, we're founded on core values of uh, self-determination, collective liberation, and community support. Uh, clearly this um, presentation overlaps a lot with the collective liberation aspect of what we're trying to do here. And we're so excited to have Antonio here to share a little bit of his perspective. Um, Antonio Bueller founded a Brome, which is, uh, is it fair to call it an alternative to school, Antonio? Yeah. It, it located in Texas to liberate children and fundamentally change the way that people think about education. He wants learners to have full autonomy over their bodies, minds, and time so they can lead meaningful and purposeful lives, positively impact society, and improve the human condition. Abrom is aligned with Antonio's desire to challenge, undermine, and create alternatives to oppressive systems so we can move toward a freer and healthier world. Um, unless somebody else from Alder Commons wants to butt in with something I forgot, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Antonio. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so this, I'm working on two different screens here. All right, so this talk is the urgency of abolition, police, prisons, and schools. Um, I gave another car, uh, talk that was similar to this at the ASDE weekend with the Alliance for Self-Directed Education. And in that, um, in that one, it was really a, it was more of a presentation and it wasn't much of a conversation. And on this one, I actually wanted it to be a conversation. So I completely changed the approach to it and I'm hoping that it works. Um, and so we shall see. So here's the agenda. All right. So we're gonna start with the survey. And this might be a little bit hard because we don't have um, a survey um, capability here, primarily because I didn't get it to Alder Commons quickly enough. But um, I guess everyone can just type it into the chat box, uh, just A, B, C, D, E, or F. Let's see if I can do this right. So there's lots of options. One is, um, do you believe, so if you believe we should, uh, and wait till I get through all of this to answer, but if you believe we should abolish police, type in A. If you believe we should abolish prisons, type in B. If you believe we should abolish schools, type in C. If you believe we should abolish none of them and maybe just reform them, type in a zero. If you think we should abolish all of them, just type in all. And if you think we should only abolish two of them, just type in the two that you think we should abolish. And just type that into the chat uh, maybe someone else will go ahead and look at what, uh, what people type, um, and then we'll, and then we'll go from there. Sound good? All right. So we'll do this survey first. We can look at it a, a little bit later. Um, I'll do a quick intro. And then what I want to do is I just want to talk generally about institutions, um, how they're formed and how they persist. Um, why, why do they become accepted as necessary? Then I want to dive into a conversation about reform. Um, I imagine that there might be some people here who are educators in conventional schools who are trying to um, change things from within. Um, and so I definitely want to hear your thoughts on that or, you know, maybe people who believe that, you know, we can get rid of a lot of things, but let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I'd really appreciate um, some back and forth on that. And then we'll talk about abolition. And we're going to do it through... Um, uh, we're going to center it around just a bunch of quotes that I've pulled from various uh, resources. And um, this can be really engaging and fun um, if we can get into some of these, or it can be kind of painful if no one wants to talk. Um, if it's painful to talk with your video on, feel free to turn your video off, maybe to talk. Sound good? All right. So... That's the survey. Good luck to everyone as they answer it. All right, 
So very quickly, I'm not going to give my full uh, introduction as to who I am. There was a brief introduction. Um, this is just pulled off of another uh, presentation. But I went through conventional schools, and I also was very much a fan of all the institutions that this great country had growing up. I was very patriotic. Um, I went to West Point mostly because it was free college, um, but also because I came from a very, you know, pro-military family and town. Um, but I did that and I spent five years in the military. I got out as soon as I could. Then I went to Stanford and I got my MBA and I went into finance. Um, and that led me into looking into education because I was thinking about buying companies and I thought education was a good way for me to spend my uh, time because I've always been a big believer in helping kids. I've always coached on the side or mentored kids on the side or have been involved with different uh, you know, volunteer efforts around kids. And I figured the best way to help kids was education. As I started going down that path, I came, uh, well, I got introduced to a lot of homeschoolers and then some unschoolers. And then I went down the self-directed education path. And I just came to this belief that if I really wanted to help kids, I had to not do it through education because I would end up hurting more kids than I would help. Um, and by more kids, I mean all kids. I hurt all kids that I would be um, you know, coming into contact with uh, through anything that brought school, um, conventional schooling into their lives, uh, particularly if it brought you know, if I was um, working on a company that went through the schooling system, or even if I was uh, doing it through a service that basically just brought schooling into the home for uh, homeschoolers. So I, I just knew I couldn't do that. Um, I moved to Austin after I, I folded my investment uh, vehicle that I was trying to do to buy the education company. And my goal was to help as many people leave schooling as possible. And once I got on the ground, I was just trying to convince parents and educate parents to allow their kids to leave school and educators to quit what they were doing so that they could support kids outside of schooling. I got two main critiques from uh, the people I talked to. One is, have you ever taught before? And two, do you have an ed degree? I never taught before, so I started teaching at a startup progressive school in Austin, and I was there for the first two years. I taught seven different classes. Um, I learned a lot about working with kids. Um, I certainly uh, didn't do a good job of not hurting kids because I was still doing school, uh, but I was doing it in a progressive context, which I, which I figured in many ways was the best I could do in a schooling context. Um, during that process, uh, there was an incident, which is one of the reasons why I'm so interested in talking about police and prison abolition, where I had a run in with the police. Um, it uh, was a situation where I saw the police abusing someone. I took out my camera, took pictures, yelled at the police. Police ended up coming after me, um, wrestling me to the ground. They arrested me and charged me with a felony of spitting in a police officer's face which in Texas carries a two to 10 year prison sentence. And so all of a sudden I became aware of uh, some of the problems with policing. I, I, I thought about it in past because I'd read articles and whatnot, but I never really um, engaged with it deeply. And through that process, uh, a lot of people rallied behind me because uh, someone came forward with uh, video footage and um, a bunch of witnesses came forward to defend me. And so I got a lot of local attention and a lot of local support. And I had a lot of people telling me their own personal stories of abuse, which were in most situations way worse than mine. And, um, and I just figured we needed to use all the support that I had um, to like really help push for um, fixing the system is the way that I probably was you know, thinking at the beginning. I just thought if we could just fire these cops, arrest them, throw them in jail, throw them in prison, send the message, um, help fix policing, that that would probably uh, be the best. And so then we started an organization called the Peaceful Streets Project. And we did a lot of Know Your Rights trainings and we did a lot of cop watching. Through the cop watching, I ended up getting arrested uh, five more times. And I ended up um, being surveilled by the police 
Um, I ended up, uh, they actually tried to bring three felony charges against me, which we found later through Freedom of Information uh, Act request. Um, and they were trying to get me from everything from child endanger endangerment, which is great when you're, you're an educator, right? Um, to, uh, um, oh, conspiracy charges. Yeah, they, they're arguing that I was, uh, you know, collecting uh, or encouraging people to collect guns and, and bombs or something. Uh, and they followed that with uh, the uh, Regional Fusion Center. And so they, they were really going after me. They, were, they had a police uh, squad car outside my house, um, just stationed there. And so I very quickly moved from thinking we could fix the police um, to thinking, well, maybe, maybe fixing the police isn't actually possible. Maybe there's something inherently problematic about the police. And, and of course, I learned a lot more um, about um, how it intersects with other issues, you know, beyond just, you know, the problem of policing, but, you know, social issues and whatnot. Um, but, uh, but after getting arrested a bunch more times and, you know, having them harass me and threaten me and physically assault me on the streets, um, I decided it was time for me to, one, get out of town and to refocus on education because, you um, uh, resisting the police uh, was a very expensive ordeal for me. Uh, I was lucky to get pro bono um, uh, legal assistance, but I still was uh, spending a ton of my own time and money out there uh, cop watching and whatnot. And so I went to check the second box after have you taught before, which was do you have an ed degree? So I went to Harvard, got my ed degree, uh, spent nine months away from Austin, uh, basically doing a sabbatical. And then I came back to Austin and I eventually opened up a Brome, which is a self-directed education community in Austin, um, much like self-directed education communities around the country to include Alder Commons. We're definitely different um, in the way, you know, it seems Alder Commons has like a whole potpourri of offerings that they provide the community. Um, and then there's the Village Free School, which is a democratic school in, uh, in Portland. And then there's flying, I know there's a flying squad cell out there, you know, so that uh, people can go out and be um, practicing self-directed education in the city. So, um, you know, there's different flavors of SDE, but we're definitely uh, an SDE center uh, community here in Austin. And we see ourselves very much as a liberation project. Uh, we do want to, you know, help liberate young people and, you know, we believe in collective liberation for all people. So um, the first quote that I wanna share is one that um, uh, um, is from a book uh, named called Bird Uncaged, Marlon Peterson. I don't believe in cages of any kind. And that is uh, something that I definitely believe in. Um, so institutions. So the first thing I want to talk about, and again, this is a conversation. So take yourselves off mute, unless you have a bunch of like loud stuff in the background, take yourself off, off mute and just dive in. Um, we have two hours to be together. And the intention for me is not to talk. The intention for me is for everyone to be in conversation. But, um, the first question that I have that I want to engage with is, is, Institutions, how and why do institutions become ubiquitous and widely accepted as necessary? And we don't have to talk about police, prisons, and schools here, but those are three institutions that I'm thinking of. Um, you know, uh, a, a lot of people would argue that the institutions are part of this social project that we're all engaged in together and they come up through forms of democracy, et cetera. Um, but does anyone have any thoughts on? on why institutions become ubiquitous and widely accepted? Uh, sometimes they're backed by the force of the state. I, I, I think they mainly exist to recreate the, the social structures as they are. So institutions either reproduce things the way that they are or violently maintain things the way that they are. I'm just going to toss in uh, the word whiteness here and white supremacy and the way um, 
you know, the, the terms you've tossed around so far, um, these institutions, they all are intersecting with um, the foundations of white supremacy and how they connect to um, our country's foundations. And so these institutions that um, have come up so far, uh, prisons, police, and schools, um, are, are designed to uphold those structures and keep them in place. Um, schooling also, uh, I would say, is here to uphold capitalism as another system. Uh, and, and that overlaps with white supremacy as well. So I'm just gonna go right for it there. Um, in terms of why they become accepted as necessary, I think institutional momentum is a huge part of that. If it's the only system you've ever known, if school looks like this and safety looks like this, then you, uh, it's hard to believe that there are alternatives if you haven't seen something different. Uh, maybe also the accumulation of, of wealth by the institutions and uh, just the um, the attraction the lower classes would have to wanting to attain that same thing um, that kind of makes a flywheel situation. Um, do you that last piece that you added? Are you saying that um, the the hope? that like the lower classes could eventually elevate into the upper class is yeah. part of that perpetuates it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think those are all, I think those are all great. Um, I have every single quote that I have that I'm gonna share with you all are from abolitionists, right? Primarily prison and industrial complex abolitionists. Um, but I think that when we look back on it, um, we could apply all of all of their positions to schooling as well. But I'll address that later, even if they don't agree with it. So the first one is capitalists need policing the most to protect their property, billions, businesses and borders by arresting the people whom they've exploited, excluded and extracted the most. And so I think this touches upon um, upon some, uh, several of the answers um, that y'all talked about, um, you know, but if you're concerned about capitalism, um, you know, I think that that's here. And I think that white supremacy also is here as well, you know, if we're talking about, you know, who's been exploited, excluded, and extracted from the most. Also, misogyny. Yeah. And, and I think that, so we've thrown out a bunch of different terms, right? Um, misogyny, white supremacy, um, capitalism. We could talk about colonialism, uh, patriarchy, ableism, adultism, right? Like there's like, the, 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 the challenge is, is that there's so many um, institutions, right? And like you can have institutions, like white supremacy is an institution, right? Um, uh, sexism is an institution, right? Uh, institution doesn't have to be a formal, you know, structure of organizations, um, but none of them stand alone. And one of the big challenges for me when I first got involved in sort of like what what I initially called police accountability was that um, I believe that if we could all just set aside all of our opinions on other things and all of our disagreements and just focus on this one issue, then we could deal with that. And then other people would be like, well, how can we deal with this if we're not going to talk about race? And I'd be like, whoa, we have a bunch of like constitutionalists over here who are actually not very good on the issue of race. And so let's not talk about that. Why create um, division when we don't need it? Um, but, but the more that I was engaged, the more I realized that by ignoring these intersections, 
um, I was doing a couple of things. One is I was making the people who were most impacted feel very unsafe in those spaces, right? And then the second thing is, is that it's really hard to take on, um, you know, these complex issues um, if, if we don't have a really good analysis of what's happening. And to have a conversation about why policing prisons and schools exist without being able to talk about race or class or imperialism, it's, it's impossible because you're effectively having um, a sanitized conversation. So another, uh, so th this, um, so Alec, I can't pronounce his last name, um, is amazing, uh, has been uh, suing municipalities across the country uh, to get rid of cash bail. Just an amazing voice. Um, he doesn't talk about abolition. He just talks about the punishment bureaucracy and the complicity of lawyers, prosecutors, and judges. But I think you'd, you'd be hard pressed to not realize that he's an abolitionist through it. Um, just, a, you know, I just love that book. Oh, um, so anyways, uh, the book is uh, uh, Usual Cruelty. So a major achievement of the punishment bureaucracy is that it has retained mainstream respect, even though it's law enforcement choices crush unprecedented numbers of people with no evidence of any unique social benefit while simultaneously allowing enormous amounts of lawlessness that cause massive harm. And so in his book, uh, Usual Cruelty, um, he lays out all the ways that the system um, is used to just crush, you know, countless people uh, throughout the, eight, the years. Um, and, and he lays out all the ways that the system uh, protects the people who cause the most harm, like the people who start wars <laughs> and you know drone people in foreign countries and uh, pollute rivers and, and water you know uh, the water table etc um, but uh, a lot of it a lot of his uh, a lot of his talk is about um, how the how law enforcement and he puts in quotes because they don't enforce the law they enforce certain laws, uh, you know, that benefit the people in power. Um, but he talks about, you know, the ways in which it maintains credibility in spite of, you know, all the harm that it does. So going back to the original question, you know, why do these in institutions become uh, widely accepted as necessary um, when by any sort of reasonable accounting, uh, we would find that, you know, just I think the simplest example would be policing. Um, you know, it causes mass harm. Uh, it lets the people who do the most harm, uh, you know, not be subject to the system. Um, and there's very few things that policing does that that um, from an intellectual perspective, we could even argue reduces harm or crime. Yet the average person, I, I haven't looked at the, uh, the survey results yet, but the average person is going to overwhelmingly say that abolition is foolish because we, we fundamentally need, need police. So why is it that it's so accepted? Like we know why it exists, you know, we talked about that, but, but why is it accepted? I think because of the ubiquity that you were kind of calling out before there's like if if there was a country or a state or like even a large city where they had something substantially different it would be a lot harder to hold on to the uh belief in the necessity of it i think i think of the uh, intense amount of fear mongering around you know, um, the other that we were talking about earlier too. Well, and the massive amounts of propaganda that we're all 
exposed to constantly through the entertainment industry and yeah. through um, through schooling, actually, you know, like we're we're taught at a very young age that the world is a really unsafe place and that there has to be special people with special um, responsibilities and rights and and skills to keep us safe from all of this danger everywhere. But I mean, my, my 10 year old is really interested in um, superhero movies right now. And, and those, I see those as a good, a good opportunity for conversation, but also like, like their job is to really indoctrinate her into this idea that there are special people with special like powers who are gonna keep us from dying, you know? And that, and that those people are not us. Yeah. Um, Angela Davis talks about how the, because our, these systems like, uh, especially, especially police abuse um, and harassment disproportionately affects people of color and our prison system disproportionately incarcerates people of color that, it's a um, most uh, you know, powerful white wealthy people in this country who benefit from these oppressive systems don't actually have any experience with them. Like they haven't been wrestled to the ground by a cop and they haven't been like pulled over for doing nothing wrong and they haven't been wrongfully incarcerated. Um, so it's really easy if you've never seen the inside of a prison or seen any of this to say, well, those like, those must be bad people and that place must be necessary. Yeah, and but then there's the challenge of, uh, so last summer uh, during the uprising, um, when public opinion shifted so dramatically, um, probably the first time in, in like the history of the United States, um, there were more people who uh, took a negative opinion of policing, at least for a very brief moment in time, than a positive one. Um, and and I'm not, I'm, I can't say for certain that that was the case, but there was a, a poll uh, that was done um, that was, you know, it, it was, it seemed like a pretty legitimate poll. And uh, the question was uh, about the burning of the, the third precinct uh, at, in Minneapolis. And 54% of Americans said that the burning down of the precinct was either um, totally justifiable or largely justifiable, right? 54% of Americans polled, um, which is remarkable. And that wasn't an internet survey. Um, I mean, that, that's remarkable, right? Like that's people saying like, yeah, like the police are so bad that sometimes you just need to go like destroy their headquarters um uh, like don't take it to a civilian review board don't file a complaint you know don't hope that they're gonna press charges against the police officer they said just just go destroy this precinct um headquarters um and and the response to that was so swift and so harsh from the right and the left uh from the left uh the the attacks were this isn't us. We don't believe in violence. We believe in in lawful policing. We believe in um, constitutional policing. Um, you know, and and we think that there are right ways to protest, right? And from the right, much of the argument was um, back the blue, and look at these surveys that say most Black people don't want to defund the police, right? And so they went straight to the they went straight to the argument of like most black people still want a strong police, and you saw democratic politicians doing that as well. Um, and I think the challenge is, is that um, yeah, most people um, across the board um, think that policing is necessary, and that's why abolitionists seem so radical, uh, you know, even amongst the people who who really want to see changes within the criminal justice system. 
and, and it's not just black people it's like you pull anyone people in the lgbt community they're disproportionately affected you know immigrants etc All right. <laughs> so the next quote is uh, quite simply, we must end the police. The hegemony of police is so complete that we often can't begin to imagine a world without the institution. And I think that that just reflects, uh, you know, the comment uh, previously about the ubiquity of the police. Um, all right, let's jump to reform. So, I mean, I think that the big challenge here is like debating reform versus uh, abolition. And, I, and I, I'm not going to try to read the chat. So if anyone has anything that they want to read off the chat, maybe someone could read off what's being typed into the chat. All right, so two questions here. Should we reform institutions that cause tremendous harm? And can reform actually strengthen harmful institutions? So, you know, can, uh, can reform actually be more problematic than it is helpful? To the extent that it prevents like, you know, more sweeping changes for sure. Well, I think that oftentimes reform sort of obfuscates the actual contradiction that underlines, underlies the whole problem. So it's like, if, if we can just find a way to do less harm or, to not harm people that look like me or to, it, it does a lot to sort of insulate certain people against the harm without ever actually like acknowledging the, un, like the, un, the thing that makes the harm happen, like the underlying contradiction that causes the harm in the first place. That makes sense what I just said. <laughs> All right, I'll just jump into the first, the first quote. So back to Alec, you know, much of the criminal justice reform movement is superficial and deceptive and is therefore dangerous. It is designed to quell calls for genuine change while preserving the architecture of mass human caging. So I love that quote. I definitely can connect to some of that and like, uh, certain campaigns that were like trending on social media last summer that were like, oh, we just need, um, you know, uh, pick your poison, whether it's um, body, cam. body cameras or, you know, insert four or five other kind of pet policies that still wouldn't have any actual accountability mm -hmm. in situations where someone was like, committing violence against bystanders. Um, it's sort of a, it, it's hard to um, answer. People get the satisfaction by like retweeting that thing of like, I'm engaged and this is what would help. And on some level it's true that it might on the edges make an improvement in some aspect of things, but um, I think it's so much harder to engage with the like well what if it was totally gone it's just like too much it's like too big of a conceptual jump for for folks i think yeah and and so and those changes often like have proven to be worse right um so like one of the big things that people have pushed you know for a long time is we just need our police to look like our community like, so we need to hire more women. We need to hire more black cops. We need to hire more Hispanic cops. We need to hire more LGBTQ cops, right? And what's happened is, is that oftentimes the, the you know, research has shown that, for example, um, uh, ethnic minorities um, are more violent as cops than white cops, right? And there's, Plenty of reasons why people argue that, that is, but you know James Baldwin, you know, made the case um, many years ago that like they're trying to prove themselves to this institution, 
And the entire reason that they're there is to like be the, you know, be that violent tool on behalf of the institution. And it's, uh, and Director Purnell, who um, is in a, uh, a lot of these quotes, because I just finished her book yesterday. Um, uh, I just feel like it's a great book, um, Becoming Abolitionist. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, you know, what she pointed out, what she learned when she was in South Africa is that like, um, you know, it, it was a colonial tactic to get locals um, in India, for example, or in, you know, South Africa to, you know, become captains of the police force and to be the face of the police, right? Because that would um, reduce dissent, um, but also, you know, like, they weren't hired to be kind and just, right? They were hired to do the job of policing. Repeated attempts to improve the sole option offered by the state despite how consistently corrupt and injurious it has proven itself will neither reduce nor address the harm that actually required the call. We need more and effective options for the greatest number of people. So Mariam Kaba, uh, who wrote um, We Do This Till We Free Us, which came out to much fanfare uh, this past year, um, you know, has been involved in abolitionist effort for years. Um, in fact, most people had no idea what she looked like until she allowed some pictures to be taken uh, for uh, one of the uh, articles she wrote. Um, she actually didn't even sign her name to much of the stuff that she used to write. Um, but yeah, so what she talks about, what abolition often, uh, abolitionists often talk about is that, you know, these institutions um, that are, are used by the state to create public order or to, um, to respond to crime, et cetera, right? They don't actually, you know, they don't reduce it, certainly, but they don't even address the harm that actually calls, uh, requires the call, right? Like when someone gets uh, murdered, or rob, right, the best they can do is arrest the person who committed the crime, right? But they don't actually address the, you know, the conditions that, that created that situation, right? Oh, no. All right. So, uh, um, can I interrupt? Please. <laughs> Sorry, there's been some stuff in the chat and it, <laughs> I didn't <laughs> jump in, but um, there's a, there is a question. Um, I'll just read it. DeRay McKesson talks about, um, quote, running toward abolition uh, through reform. You know me, I have to represent the social worker's perspective. How do you see the value of harm reduction in the movement toward abolition? So is that a question for me? So Doreen McKesson is certainly not an abolitionist. Doreen McKesson is very firmly in the reform camp. Um, in fact, most abolitionists can't stand Doreen McKesson because he is so protective of the systems. Um, and it's a challenge because sometimes you won't, uh, celebrity activists um, often, they benefit so greatly from the system, right? Like they may have something that they think is wrong with the system and they critique it and they run to Ferguson to get their pictures taken, right? Um, but then they start getting invited by Google to give a talk, they, they get a grant for $2 million to start an organization. And very quickly, um, it becomes clear that, that they're getting paid to argue for uh, modifications to the system as opposed to actually striking at the root of what the challenge is. So I'm, um, anything that Doreen McKesson says, very, very, um, he has a persuasive way of talking, right? But I just, you know, his arguments, um, I think, are usually very problematic. Um, and so I don't know what the context is of his statement of running toward abolition. 
um, through reform? So, is that what you said? I can talk about it. Yeah. Sorry, Antonio, it's Alicia, and I am um, just sick today, so I'm not on screen much. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it was when, um, you know, he kind of co-opted the uh, eight, it was when the whole eight can't wait hashtag came out. Um, and, uh, you know, he obviously pissed, pissed off a lot of abolitionists by, um, by co-opting that marketing framework. Um, but also um, he has an a larger argument basically saying like, I've um, like, talking about how um, reform fits more with how democracy works. And so, um, you know, my, my social worker perspective, thinking about harm reduction and thinking that democracy is what we live in right now. And how do we, you know, democracy works in incremental change, right? It works slow machinations and all that. Um, how do we get to something as large as abolition when, you know, uh, there's still people who, um, who uh, yeah, are on the ground, I guess, kind of, um, I don't know, I have, a hard, I have a hard time bridging the gap. And I think it's a lot of people, it's so much easier for people to imagine the, uh, you know, DeRay's point of view because it meshes easier with our current system of government. Do you, what do you think of that? I think some quotes that I've listed here might um, speak to that, uh, will speak to that. Um, I think that a big part of the reason people default to the reform argument, one is that they can't imagine anything else. Like abolition, they haven't engaged with it. And so right off the bat, they just think it's so wild, kind of like unschooling. Like you can't possibly do that. You, the kids will never learn how to read, right? Um, so like, it's just, it's just outside of their conception of what's possible. So they don't, they don't seriously engage it. But I think the other piece is that people are afraid of what they don't know. Right. And, and they're afraid of losing what they have, even if what they have is virtually nothing. Right. Um, and so one of the big reasons why people support police and prisons is because what are we going to do about the murderers? What are we going to do about the rapists? I've been a victim before. Like, who's going to protect me? Um, um, or like, yeah, this all sounded great when I was 20, but now I have a house and a car, right? And I have investments. And do I really want, do I really support getting rid of all these systems that protect it? Now, granted, they're not here to protect me. They're here to protect Jeff Bezos, right? And they're here to protect, you know, um, Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan. Um, but, but I still have my little nest egg, and I'm afraid of losing that. Um, I, I disagree with the notion that reform fits how democracy works, you know, through incremental change. Uh, the entire creation of this country right from you know the the europeans that originally came here you know to like the people who've been building it over the past 200 years you know um it was created through some pretty uh audacious um violent uh non-democratic decisions right um and they put this system in place and it's been refined over the years through the uh, input of millions of people, um, but but it was a system largely created by, you know, white male slaveholders um, who were intent on genocide, um, and and that's the system they that they created. And so now we're stuck with that system. And someone argues that you know democracy happens through incremental change, uh, tinkering. Um, on that system that was created. So I don't necessarily agree with that. And I'm really proud of all the uh, abolitionists who came out hard against him with his eight, eight can't wait with his, uh, with, with a counter eight to abolition uh, 
um, effort, which, which I thought was, was pretty strong. But unfortunately, he has such a huge platform. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I definitely am not defending DeRay, but uh, I just, he's got pretty much the whole DNC behind him. So mm -hmm. makes it tough. But isn't it so telling, um, you know, to think that the Eight Can't Wait campaign, you know, that, that went through the Minneapolis Police Department, right? I mean, like Derek Chauvin got that training and then this still happened. Like, and I think that's that's maybe what you're speaking to, Antonio. It's like if if reform is treated like a checkbox, like don't worry, check, we did the eight can't wait, we're done now, then not only are you not working towards real change, but you like, yeah, it becomes an impediment to 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 actual change because you think you've already done it. And it sort of reminds me of like. Um, a lower performing school or whatever bullshit that means with like low test scores, which is bullshit. But, um, you know, if a school needs support, they'll just like pour a ton of money into the school and like, great, well, now you have a new computer lab, and you have new textbooks, and you have a mandatory mindfulness class. And it's like, that's not disrupting the school to prison pipeline. That's not like decreasing anxiety. It's not, it's like, it's still aimed at these like, principles of how do we how do we increase performance instead of like how do we dismantle the the system and how much energy goes into that right like all these reforms take up so much energy of people who fundamentally want to see change and they're told by the people in charge right the politicians you know the people with all the money um, uh, educators, right? Like the way to pursue this change is, is, is to go to the institution, beg them to change their ways of doing things, and advocate for, you know, a laptop for every child or um, uh, diversity hires or, um, you know, uh, response to resistance, non-lethal response to resistance training or tasers or whatnot. And so people just put all their time and energy into reforms. Um, and then you come out the other end five years later, nothing's actually fundamentally changed except that that institution got a ton of money to implement these changes um, but or these reforms, um, but nothing's actually changed. And then and then when something else happens and they say, OK, well, what other reforms do you want to advocate for? And, and we'll take years to do that as well. Dereka Purnell says reforms can't fix a, a policing system, right? That, that is not broken, right? Like when the, when the system's doing exactly what it is intended to do, like you can't reform that. <laughs> Um, hey, Antonio, so, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I was just going to, Sarah, if you want, I know you, it looked like you might have wanted to jump in. Oh, um, thank you. I should, I shouldn't, I, I should have my video off because I look like I'm talking when I'm not talking as I move around. Um, I was just going to sort of layer um, with Rachel's comments, tying the concept of reform to education. I feel more comfortable talking about that because that's my that's my realm. And um, there was a meme floating around this this past week about, hey, let's um, instead of in higher ed offering exams the way we do, let's make them open book. Let's make them open book so that kids don't have to cram and memorize and let's let them take exams until mastery. And, um, you know, lots of folks seemed really excited about that idea. And um, so I sat with it a few days and realized that even if we do that, we're still operating within the same system. There's still an exam. There's still an exam to be taken. Um, we're still operating within a system that's based in coercion and power and control and a comparative framework um, that's non-consensual. Non and um, we'll just end up, like Antonio said, five years down the down the road, even after making that reform with um, 
the same inequities being perpetuated by the system. So um, I agree with everything that's being said here. Can I add on to that just a little bit? I'd love, love that. It. I love what you just said. Um, and it reminds me of when there's a child endangerment issue, like a real one, like we hear about all kinds of terrible CPS cases, but when there's a real one, CPS has to come out, the social worker comes out and they have to off most times usually have to have an officer with them. Well, I would rather have an officer by my side who's had all kinds of trainings on, you know, de-escalation and non-lethal force and has a body cam and all these things than I would having, you know, a super like, you know, <laughs> like the ones we have here. <laughs> um, so I guess that also is where I, I get a little I get a little stuck sometimes, even though I'm so, so I'm not stuck. I mean, I'm not stuck in my mind for this, but it's the daily, the daily stuff that, that is so tough. What would it actually look like in practice for you in a scenario? Right. Yeah. And I'm totally not saying we need to have answers on this. I'm totally not saying like trying to put Antonio on like give me the answer. I'm just I'm just adding to it. It's 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 very like in the sense of like the institution of school is very similar as the institution uh, that we have set up for child protection and the institute that we have you know even our mental health institutions how those are set up with such gates and uh, gatekeepers and all this. Uh, it's just another one of those institutions where. Um, Police have, it, you know, the, the the tentacles of the police structure has its, you know, is is there constantly, kind of under the surface. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's hard when when you just assume that the institution, like it is the institution that we need to defer to, right? Like, like what else are you gonna do? That's all there is. Right. And that's like the brilliance of, I think, police prisons and schooling. Right. They've they've gobbled up so much. So many things that we can't imagine what it could possibly look like without them. And so it's just like, yeah, how do you protect kids without the police and social workers? Like, that's just like a default. Like, how do you protect them? What's your answer to that? Right. And like when there's no space to create alternatives. Oftentimes people are left at a loss of what to say. Mac, you were gonna say something. I think it's Mac. Yeah, hey, hey Antonio. Um, I'm so sorry I came late. Uh, a lot, you were mentioning the reasons why people uh, lean towards reform. Um, there's a lot of just fatigue, right? I mean, there are people that, that just got a passport a u.s passport um i'm a black male and i feel like man i just i just my life just got good <laughs> you know you know your abolitionist stance it sounds great right but but they've really eradicated a lot of groups in in a nasty fashion right i mean what you're going up against or choosing to go up against is it's almost unfathomable Right, like, like, there's not a, a far nation that would go up against what you're trying, what uh, abolitionists are, are suggesting. Okay, um, so, so, like, what, so, so, like, what is the viability of your stance? <clears throat> uh, so, so, I, I think that you're right that the the people in power or the institutions in power. And it's not like there's a cabal of like 10 people in charge, right? Like it's, it's millions of people in charge because so many people benefit from these systems. Right. Um, but yeah. They, they, but they, they're vicious, right? Like you look at what they did to a black Panther party, right. Um, of all the things that they did, the thing that scared the government the most was their free food, their, their food program for kids. Right. Um, and so then yeah. they, and they killed a bunch of the Black Panthers and, and jailed most of the rest, right? Um, there's more drugs in the communities. A lot, there's a bigger impact post-Black post Panther, right? Negative. 
And then uh, Dereka Purnell, actually, in her book, she um, she uh, goes through a lot of the examples of like people who are abolitionists, like part of abolitionist movements and, and all of the work that the government did to kill them or imprison them. Right. Um, she talked about what they did to move in Philadelphia. Right. Um, and move like um, and, and, and other organizations as well or in, and other movements. And, and we've seen it throughout history. Right. And I think that it can certainly be scary. Um, I think that any time that you're going up against power, um, you know, power may want to attack you. And I've seen it just from cop watching. Like cop watching should be the, the last thing police are worried about because like they know if there's anyone on scene that's not going to be a threat to them, it's the person with the camera, <laughs> right? But I was always the biggest threat to them. You know, I was the one that they went after every time. Um, yeah, and so um, abolitionists, you know, people who are doing abolitionist work are certainly going to be a target uh, for, um, you know, whatever, whoever the people in, in power are. And we've seen it with like environmental activists and how the federal government has repeatedly, um, you know, brought charges against environmental activists, felonies and thrown them in prison for decades for things like, you know, just chain themselves to a pipeline, um, you know, just completely disproportionate uh, um, harm um, but yeah no it, it is scary I, I acknowledge that and um, one of the things that so many of the of the abolitionists argue for is um, you know having a diversity of tactics having a wide network of people who are engaged um, and probably the thing that's the most underrated uh, but the most powerful is is creating lots of um, projects and experiments um, where we're actually practicing this stuff in real time. And if it's a distributed network that's not hierarchical um, and um, there's just projects everywhere and the more projects you have, the more that people uh, can get introduced to these ideas and, and create alternatives or refuse to participate in the systems that exist, you know, that that can be a way of undermining um, these systems uh, without necessarily having to you know, become targets like MOVE or the Black Panther Party became. I think this is where I tend to get caught up, which is, it's easy to say, oh, sorry. I think that was an accidental unmute. I went ahead and muted them. Sorry. Um, I was just gonna say, it's easy to say, what you don't want, but then what fills its place? Yeah. I I'm I I was just talking to Kiki about this actually because it's in Angela Davis's book, Our Prisons Obsolete. Um, she talks about how the you know those who who wanted to end slavery in the states were abolitionists, obviously, and they succeeded in the, in terms of that form of slavery. Our, we replaced it with mass incarceration, but that form of slavery was a successful abolition movement, and no one knew what the country would look like without it. All they knew was that we had to get rid of it. You know, I mean, our, our entire country's economy was based around tobacco, and what what how would we operate without that workforce, and what would we do? And I do think that it's like, I've always gotten stuck on that in questions around abolition, but I do think that's also like part of white supremacy culture of like, we have to know every single detail and what's going to, what's exactly it's going to look like and what's the exact solution. And has to, we have to have it perfect before we can even try to make it better. Um, but what, she, yeah. And what she's saying, and it sounds like what Antonio is saying too, is like, we know that these current systems are horrible. And we've known it for so long. And we've, in order to figure out the next step, we have to start to get rid of them. And I think that's something that I, I thought she just like summarized so beautifully. Yeah, I think it's also a schoolish mindset, 
as well, right? You know, just the notion that like, unless we know what we're going, like what's going to replace it, like we can't move forward, right? But some things are so bad that you don't have to know what's going to replace it, right? Like if you have a, you, you know, I, I don't know what's a good, if you have a bear that's biting your leg, right? <laughs> you don't want to figure out like, you know, like, well, what are we going to do without the bear, right? You just try to get, get out of the situation. That's a bad example, but um, all right. Let's let's jump through some of these other uh, quotes real quick. So this Erica Meaner's uh, quote addresses sort of like the many different uh, roots. But um, I, I threw up a bunch of these quotes for different potential talking points. This one talks like really about the notion of like reforms that can potentially work. Um, and a lot of people say that like, all we need is you know, more diversity hires within the police force and we just need the police to know the members of the community and that's gonna reduce the power. And, and so that's a, that's a statement against that. Um, this is really powerful because when people want um, change, often the people in power will talk about, um, you know, they'll demand uh, peace like peaceful protesting, and then they'll offer up uh, a task force to look into something. Um, and it's just a huge uh, suck of time, energy, and money where everyone gets excited about that. They're hoping for a consent decree or something, and they just put all their energy into that instead of organizing within their communities to try to create something better or demand the abolition of, of these systems. And then this is the last quote for the, <laughs> the reform piece from Marianne Kava. When you start talking about policing as a system that's actually about harassment, violence, and surveillance, you're not going to accept bullshit reform. All right. So let's, so um, in terms of, of abolition, um, this is from Marianne Kava, Kava's uh, book, you know, We Do This Till We Free Us, right? Um, which is a bunch of essays that she's written over time, some in her name, some not. Um, but they talked about non-reformist reform. So um, sometimes people will argue, well, like reform is the way to go. And abolitionists aren't opposed to reforms, right? Like the notion of harm reduction isn't lost on, on most abolitionists. Uh, a harm reduction um, approach when it comes to prisons is to install air conditioners in prisons, right? Like we have people die every year in Texas prisons that are un, that, that don't have air conditioning, right? And it can get into the 100, you know, 100 plus degrees in cells and people die every year from um, heat exhaustion and heat stroke inside prisons. And so there are people who, you know, advocate for installing air conditioners in prisons. That in of itself isn't inherently abolitionist, um, right? It doesn't, do anything to, to abolish the prison, but that's a that's a reform that most abolitionists can support, you know, while they're advocating for the abolition of prisons. And so um, I'll read through them, even though you shouldn't read from slides that often. But you know, the non-reformist reforms that she suggests is defund the police dramatically and redirect those funds to other social goods. Like that's a that's a reform that's worth doing. Ending cash bail, um, overturning the police bill of rights, which allow, which basically gives the police like unmatched uh, rights to basically act with impunity. Um, abolish police unions, uh, crowd out the police in our communities, disarm the police. Um, and so, you know, you a, a police with a billy club is still a police officer right, but they don't have a gun, right, and that, you know, you're not getting rid of the police, but that, you know, that has the potential to really reduce harm. Uh, create create abolitionist, abolitionist message that disrupt the idea of cops equal safety, build community-based interventions that address harms without relying on police, such as um, conflict resolution teams that you could call instead of police, evaluate any reforms based on these criteria. So when they come to you with a different reform, such as body cameras um, or increased 
sensitivity training, you can go right here and you can be like, no, this doesn't, this doesn't meet any of those, um, of, of these, uh, you know, non-reformist reforms. And then think, think through the end of police and imagine alternatives. So those are all non-reformist. You know, that's an approach to thinking about reforms. All right, so abolition. So whew, are some institutions irredeemable and should we abolish policing, prisons and schooling? I think I did peek at the, uh, the chat and it looked like most people said all three are worth abolishing. Um, people who didn't might feel that they're in the minority and, and might not want to speak up, which is fair. Or some, are, yeah, go on. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, I was just wondering about, as a part of the model of, abol of abolishing policing prisons and schooling at the same time building new systems that work better for more of the people more of the time, you know? So um, like prioritizing learner directed education as opposed like building those structures up as we, as we in schooling, you know, like, prior, like part of the, part of the model of abolition for me is, is it's about building things as much as it is about like dismantling things, you know? I don't know, sorry to interrupt you with that. I don't know that, that wasn't a sidetrack, but. No, absolutely. And you'll see in, in, in many of these quotes from here on out, it talks about creating alternatives, uh, trying to create basically the future that we want to see. Um, and, it, and there are abolitionists who are very wary of creating new systems too, right? They, maybe they don't want to create new systems. Maybe the, one of the big problems is, you know, these powerful systems that very quickly uh, get co-opted to serve um, the status quo or to perpetuate itself as opposed to, you know, what the people who are creating it, you know, thought it would do. And so um, there's a lot of abolitionists who don't want to create like a network of self-directed education communities that are approved as like, this is the way for education um, to replace schools or to have like friendly, friendly security people who aren't going to kill you, who are going to patrol the streets, right? Like, you know, people don't necessarily want to create alternatives that are effectively going to become the new system. I, I come from the social work world and I, I know there's a few more of us in this uh, meeting and I, during the uprising, every, I felt like everyone was turning to social work to replace police. Um, when in reality, like there's so many other issues that are contributing to these problems that like cannot be solved by social workers, like lack of housing and like, you're not going to, you know, meditate your way out of poverty or out of, uh, into your basic needs. So, um, like, I feel like abolition, like, it, like it's just like another, um, vein that we can go down, but sorry for taking us off track. <laughs> Jordan, I'm so glad you brought that up. Like it, in the end, like someone who is being arrested when someone calls the police, like the, that's the last st step. It should be the last step. Like it's addressing a symptom, not the underlying need and the underlying cause. And like we, you know, we've, we've defunded our, you know, public and mental health resources and social services while we've been funding cops. It's like, it should be the opposite. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll jump in here. I think I've, I've been, so I'm actually writing a dissertation on immigration policies and immigration history. And so I've been kind of listening and thinking about a couple of things that I feel like could be brought into here in this conversation, which is one, when I, when I think about the historical development of like policing, for example, you know, starting with the colonial period, you know, through slave patrol and then sort of developing in municipalities and cities and states, and then eventually the border patrol and, you know, border enforcement. 
Um, it seems to me like it's not really possible to speak about abolition unless it begins with borders, like the actual border itself. And you know, Antonio, if you're down in Texas, I'm sure the news is much more saturated with border stuff than perhaps for those of us up in Oregon and such. Because, um, you know, because ultimately, like we've been talking about, the state is about territory, right? And the, the United States in particular is one that's been, you know, uh, it's, con it's conquest through displacement and genocide that we've already spoke about. And of course, then the only way to maintain that is to constantly police it. And that's how, you know, like you were saying before, Antonio, um, you know, we're all complicit in that. You know, anyone who owns property is complicit in the police state because the police state is what actually ensures your right to have this so-called piece of private property, which is like one of the fundamental um, attributes of our state, right? And and then that um, you know connects into the broader discussion about like nation states and you know, again, so like there's this broader issue, like geopolitical issue, uh, that it seems to me it needs to be like somehow woven into this conversation because. Um, you know, you can go, you, you probably would have to go very far into Mexico, for example, and find a lot of people who wish that they had a stronger police state because cartels and gangs completely dominate. And, you know, the police are actually, you know, you could argue the police are themselves a form of like a gang or a cartel, a monopoly on violence is Weber's um, definition. And some people would prefer to have at least one centralized police force over like multiple competing gangs that are you know rivals for territory so there's that issue that like that raises a question like again in the absence of police what emerges more gang activity more which is you know and that could look and, and manifest in different ways uh, militia groups etc and then the other thing that i wanted to mention here that seems to be absolutely fundamental because you know full disclosure like i said i'm a phd student i teach at the university of oregon and in my classes, you know, I always try to weave in a little bit of uh, talk on abolition and you know, prison industrial complex, of course, immigration, the border industrial complex and such. And one thing I try to weave in there as well is what is the meaning of justice, right? What purpose does the police serve or police state serve in terms of serving justice in our, you know, the so-called, you know, we're a system of laws. And, you know, there really needs to be an emphasis on transformative justice. You know, alternative forms of justice, which is to say, like, because there's always going to be murderers, there's always going to be rapists, there's always going to be thieves. And the question is, what do we do with those people? Right? What does that look like? And for some people, like, you know, that means execution. For other people, that means community service. For other people, that means prison. Right? And so, and I don't, I'm not going to pretend to ha have any answers to that. I'm just, I just feel like this conversation can't be like, it, it could be more full with that sort of element brought into it because. Ultimately, when you think about in practice what all this means, that's like like what are like when the rubber hits the road. That's what we're really talking about here is like what does justice look like in a system that doesn't have police, and who gets to enact that justice, right? Is it go we go back to the olden days where it's just like um like I said, you know, the militia strings a guy up from a tree. Like I don't know if that's like is that really, so like, you know that those are questions that are going to have to be like navigated and negotiated. But I think needs a lot more um, substance to begin to have like a to get the conversation, and not just this conversation in particular, but just more generally this conversation on abolition to get it like some momentum. So anyway, that's just some thoughts I had as I was sitting here kind of looking at my dissertation and thinking about this other stuff. Yeah, I think that those are fair questions and they often come up, um, you know, in response to uh, people who are advocating, you know, for abolitionist um, alternatives. And so I just jumped to this last one, right? The goal is not to replace cops with other people to police our neighborhoods. The goal is to begin eradicating the reasons we call cops in the first place. And organizers and community members must be tasked with completely changing the dynamics of the area, not just the people who respond to calls. That is partly what abolition is, eradicating the prison industrial, industrial complex and harm at the same time, over time, to make both obsolete. And so there's a lot of, you know, as many of you know, there's a lot of abolitionists who, like the goal is not just to get rid of police and prisons, right? It's, it's to address the reason why people think we need police and prisons. It's to deal with the interpersonal harm and the social harms that 
that are happening in society and, and addressing um, you know, the things that feed that, the causes that feed that so that we can actually have um, a better, safer, more just society in advance of, of uh, getting rid of police or, or you know, in tandem with getting rid of these systems. Um, and then uh, two before this is uh, a Kaba quote, as an abolitionist, what I care about are two things, relationships and how we address harm. The reason I'm an abolitionist is because I know that prisons, police and surveillance cause inordinate harm. I'm actually trying to eradicate harm, not reproduce it, not reinforce it, not maintain it. And then, you know, people like me who want to abolish prisons and police, however, have a vision of a different society built on cooperation instead of individualism, on mutual aid instead of self-preservation. So I, I think that, you know, there is a fear that when you take away these systems, there's going to be a vacuum. And what's going to fill that vacuum is going to be worse. Um, and I think that's a, you know, a fear that's been conditioned in many of us. And, you know, um, and in the worst of situations, yet yeah, it does seem pretty terrifying. It seems like what you're speaking to is the reason to prioritize um, like abolishing school as well as abolishing the prison industrial complex. You know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about if the function of school is to introduce children to our systems of social relations and then to like normalize their behavior to fit with those systems and then um, to provide childcare so workers can go to work, um, then creating, like prioritizing learning, like learner-directed learning sets the context for um, discovering new ways of being together. Um, that was a thought that I just had. I really like that thought, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically, your statement that um, we need to, did you say normalize new ways of being together? Yeah, I think, I think like, um, you know, school was really traumatizing for me and now I'm a parent. And um, my experience with school was, you know, the, the function that it served was to like teach me how to operate within white supremacist, cis patriarchal capitalism, and then to like normalize my behavior through punishments or rewards. And then making sure that like rich people's kids stayed rich and poor people's kids stayed poor and middle class people's kids stayed middle class and then providing child care. Um, but if we if we prioritize learner directed learning, like I, I think kids are naturally oriented towards justice and so um, towards fairness. And so that creates this this possibility for new ways of interacting with each other for like our children to discover new ways of interacting with each other that aren't based on, dom they're not about domination, but are based around care, like, you know, like mutual care and um, I guess. So it's, it's, it's why like, I'm not just a prison abolitionist. Like I'm also a school abolitionist is because I think like school, the job of school is to like make sure that all that stuff stays, gets recreated. <laughs> you know, um, if that makes sense. It does make sense. Yeah. Makes sense. I, I am right there with you. My partner, um, before we even came around to this awareness of abolition, um, he would say school is jail. School, school was jail for me. Um, having experienced something similar to what you described. And um, that's a powerful thing to sit with. Thanks. I think one of the fascinating things about the abolitionist movement, um, um, a lot of the people who have been identified as of late as people who've really been pushing forward 
um, a lot of them really believe in schooling. And they really, uh, like a lot of them are educators or were educators within conventional schools. And in much of their writing, they, they often recognize like there's a lot of things about schooling that's problematic, but, um, but they very often jump right into the like, you know, schools not prison argument, right? Like, you know, we need to fund community resources and they include in that list schools. And I do think that it's a, it's a disconnect, right? Like there's a, a belief that the system can be um, harnessed to help push, you know, for um, some of the other goals that they have in terms of prison and uh, police abolition or the pr uh, prison industrial complex abolition. Um, and, uh, and I think that there's just like, you know, it's just like, hey, if we're critiquing dominance and power over, like, you know, we, we can't just ignore the fact that, you know, schools are very much that. I, I think it's true that schools don't function like prisons for, for certain people. I mean, that's a, like, that's a class thing. You know, if you, if you go to a school that's resourced because um, the parents are affluent, then they're, you know, they're, those children are being, they're learning the skills to become the ruling class. And that's not prison. It's, the, it's not the same as like kids who grew up working class and poor, you know, and, um, you know, it's a really different experience. So some, some of my friends who I, I have this argument with had a really different experience in school where they, it was like school for them was like this, this opportunity of like this opening up of like, into, of, of intellectual opportunities where the experience that I had in school was like, was, um, very much oriented it was very much about punishment and like taking away of choices and i um i think that like that's part of the way that capitalism functions is some you know this idea that some people are on top of other people you know i i feel like that's really baked into school too so which is hard a hard thing to like to argue away, you know, that's why people move to other, that's why they change addresses to get their kids into quote unquote better schools, you know, so that, um, so that their children don't experience the prison like school experience, you know? Yeah, I, I think I want to really shift to uh, like focusing on schooling because I feel like most people here are pretty much on board with the uh, prison industrial complex abolition. But I just want to highlight just a couple of quotes that I think are worth acknowledging. So like the original question is, are some institutions irredeemable, right? And I, and I argue that like some institutions are so bad that, that reform shouldn't even be an option, right? And so our punishment system grounded in genocide and slavery, right? Um, like even if it didn't replicate <laughs> like all these things, I think that some things just need to go. Right. And, you know, so I think that when it comes to like prison industrial complex, right, it just needs to go. Right. It's built on such, um, you know, rotten uh, histories. Right. And then uh, Sujana Reddy, who's going to be referenced in multiple uh, quotes coming up, though, uh, we would be wise to remember that the role that uh, Indian boarding schools have had in cultural genocide and breaking part of indigenous families and communities. That's a that's a core piece of of the history of schooling in the West, right? Which had, was then um, taken elsewhere. And then uh, Marlon Peterson wrote this book, Bird and Cage. It came out this year to much less fanfare than some of the other books that came out, uh, but it's a fabulous, fabulous read. And he talks about how America harms and sells a lie of the American dream to everyone, including those of us not incorporating the framing of this nation. Um, and, um, and I think that, you know, that's often sold particularly through uh, schooling. And, and this is just a really, this is only a tiny piece of the quote, but I'll read the entire quote. So abolition is a politics of creationism. 
You know, so it's not just about ending police and prisons, right? It's about more than that. Wanting to end policing is wanting to create thriving communities that do not need an armed state security force that has no true legislative and judicial accountability. A world without prisons is a manifestation of solutions to socioeconomic problems. A world without prisons is, is a root reckoning of the community problems that preface the prison problems that men like Eddie Ellis and Larry White asserted in the non-traditional approach to criminal and social justice. Abolition is wanting to live without fear. Have police succeeded in establishing uh, societies of safety? Have prisons? Have parole, probation, deportation? No, 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 and no. But I get why abolition seems impractical to many and unsustainable to others. Fair. Asking people to imagine an America without mass incarceration. That would mean that there was never a government policy and law enforcement directive to implement a war on drugs. Working backward, no war on drugs would mean that there was no Jim Crow, redlining, or mass lynching of Black people. No Jim Crow would have meant that slavery of Black people never happened, which would mean that mass kidnapping of Africans would not have happened which means that the story of American ingenuity embedded in the mythical American dream would never have happened. Abolition means the undoing of America, not just the mere unraveling that happened in 2020. No wonder it scares people. George Floyd's eight minutes of American martyrdom fame interrupted the comfort of the American facade, but it wasn't enough to prevent more than 70 million people from voting in solidarity for a white supremacist sympathizer as president of the free world. His racist, sexist, deceptive, and megalomaniac habits were not enough for people to partake in a fucking solidarity vote against him and his unsettling tweets that caused international hypervigilance. Big George's eight minutes and 46 seconds were not enough for a quick arrest of the cops who killed Breonna Taylor. The family and their supporters wanted the arrest of her killers as justice in their eyes. Oprah, Beyonce, a whole ass new organization called Untold Freedom, Mass protests for months, a Saturday night live performance from Megan D. Stallion, a Louisville state of emergency declaration, a $12 million wrongful death lawsuit win for Brianna's family, global pressure from allies in the Caribbean, Africa, Europe could not get expedited justice for Brianna's family. The president elect couldn't do it. But we got Black Lives Matter painted on streets across the world. Just think that that's an amazing quote. Um, and then the last thing I'll just share is, is this um, quote, uh, which <laughs> many people reference, but what is, so to speak, the object of abolition? Not so much the abolition of prisons, but the abolition of a society that could have prisons, that could have slavery, uh, that could have the wage, and therefore not abolition as the elimination of anything, but abolition as the founding of a new society. So all good quotes. Um, that I wanted to have this conversation sort of revolve around quotes. Um, okay, so police and uh, prison abolition. I um, think I'll just skip through all these. I'll highlight this one. By defamiliarizing the familiar, I hope to eliminate the terror of the mundane and quotidian um, rather than uh, exploit uh, the shocking spectacle. Um, and so one thing that I think that is worth acknowledging before we get into the uh, schooling aspect is um, a lot of abolitionists uh, like move beyond just the worst cases of police violence, like the ones that make the headlines, like the killings um, or the rapes or the you know uh, very visible police assaults, but just like the the daily uh, terrorism that so many people feel, like people who like are constantly checking their rearview mirror or people who are constantly keeping an eye out for a cop to turn the corner um, because they're afraid that they're going to get harassed or they're going to get arrested or, or whatever. Um, and now I'll, I'll, I, I do wanna point this out because I think this is relevant to a uh, schooling piece. Some community members resist abolition because they rely on police as a source of employment. Cities use policing as a jobs program the same way that states use prisons to revitalize rural economies. And I think this explains a lot as far as like why so many people um, support this, right? When you think about 
1 million police in the country. And then I don't even know how many corrections officers and how many defense lawyers that benefit from the system and prosecutors and judges and all the people that are, um, that make their living through the associated industries that support these systems, you know, it's huge, right? It's not just the police officers that are, that are um, employed. Um, and then, but I think that you could probably take that to schooling, you know, as far as like, why do so many people support schooling? Okay, so school, school abolition. Um, these are just three, three, uh, three screenshots that I just threw up there, right? The first one, the one in the, in the foreground is the Texas Senate bill drops teacher requirements that the Ku, Ku Klux Klan is morally wrong. Um, the big backlash to critical race theory, which in most cases, in probably 99.99% of schools, like wasn't even a thing that anyone was talking about. Um, you know, uh, you know, the way that so many uh, states have responded to even the threat of people talking about um, issues of race, you know, uh, has been pretty remarkable. And then the way that, um, you know, schools have uh, approached the pandemic, right? You know, like uh, there was this article, 99% drop in suspensions in the first half of the year, as most New York City students learn from home. Like, it's just like this, you know, they're just pointing out that, you know, there's so so many fewer um, suspensions, you know, when people are remote and like it, people completely miss like how harmful, you know, just being in school can be. Anyways, those are just some screenshots, but jumping into the actual quotes, um, there's so many good ones, but um, as far as school abolition, is, is there anyone on the call who actually doesn't believe that school abolition is a good thing? or something that we should be striving for? Or that might be a little bit too radical? I think the issues that I have are the same as in the others of like, uh, we, there, there is like a replacement. There needs to be something to replace certain functions of school. Um, and that, you know, that gets to these like broader social issues um, that need to be, you know, like in the criminal justice case, it's like addressing poverty is sort of the prereq for a lot of the like community-based solutions or like, you know, addressing the root causes of crime and like school provides childcare for families. And like a lot of those younger kids uh, might need supervision in some context and don't have a place to get it. Uh, without school. So I don't know, maybe just rehashing the same concern, but I, I think it holds here too. Does anyone else have any concerns or apprehension about school abolition? I think um, what um, Joe and I had been talking about earlier today was uh, we were talking about like early intervention. And so like that availability of resources for people who otherwise wouldn't have access to them is there through schools. Um, and I also think of creating the alternatives to schools that also takes a certain like privilege and amount of resource that people would have to um, negotiate to make happen um, or have make happen because um, people have people send their kids to school while they go to work. It's a source of childcare. And if they don't have those strengthened communities, then how do you get to that point? Seems like a lot of that is wrapped up in the prior conversation about what we, what kind of future we want to create for one another in which police are not needed, in which we do show up for one another and we are showing community care. Um, with those measures in place, all, all the things you're talking about will, would be in place. Folks would have child care, um, families would have resources and that could eliminate the need then for schools and I just wanna bring up that when I talk with people about this, I, I feel like I have to make clear that we're not talking about abolishing education. Everybody just starts to freak out that, you know, what are you talking about? How, how is anybody to learn anything? Like Antonio, you said earlier, how would, how would a child learn how to read? We're not talking about abolishing education. We're talking about abolishing schools. And those two are fundamentally different. And that's often my entry point to, to having this discussion with people. And that sort of puts them at ease. Um, so that we can talk meaningfully about what that could look like. Uh, 
is this every level of school that you, you guys are referring to or just K through 12? What? That's a great question. Um, I, I, I think that for me, I'm going to answer for myself. Um, I think that conventional K-12 schooling should be abolished, um, at least to the extent that it's compulsory. I think that having classes that are offered to people and they have the option of participating or not, like that's something I'm comfortable with. And now, of course, when you offer something, sometimes there's, you know, coercion or like expectations that that really bind kids, which I don't think is necessarily cool. Um, but but when I think of school abolition, I don't think of abolishing forever the opportunity for a kid to sit in a class um, and learn algebra. You know, I think of these. Um, these institutions that basically force a kid to sit there and participate uh, in something where they don't have the autonomy to opt out. Um, I think that uh, when you think about it in that way, um, higher education isn't necessarily um, a part of that conversation for many people because in many ways, you know, you can choose not to go to college and you can choose amongst different types of colleges. Um, although I, I think that there's also an argument to be made for you know, uh, higher education also being a, a huge driver of many of the problems, um, you know, uh, both at a societal level and of what it does to individuals. That's my answer. Does anyone else have a different answer? I, the, the consent piece feels like pretty critical to me. And I wonder if that's not something that can be, that feels easier to recast as a reform in a sense of like, if you had schools essentially identically as they are now with all of the other problems, but uh, it was optional to go. I think you would, one, you would, you know, for the kids who, least want to be there, they'd have an easier out. Um, but I think it would also force schools to change a lot to address some of these other concerns. Um, I, I don't know, maybe that's in the category of non-reformist reform, um, but. I, my, my immediate response to that is that you'd have to actually give consent to the child right? Because there's a lot of kids who will still be forced to go by their parents, right? And once they enter into, like, they could say they're opting into that school. And then once they walk through the doors, they're essentially, you know, held hostage to the authority of the school. Um, you know, if it's the parent that's demanding that they be there because of their own fears and insecurities, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that that's you know, consensual. I think that's like the big challenge, right? Like, do kids actually get a say in this? There's also the pressure of just parents having to go to work. And um, like, that's one of the big functions that I think school serves is this kind of monopoly on, on childcare for folks who can't afford tuition driven childcare. Um, Speaking as a parent, that's a that's a real thing for me. Yeah, my, my concern is um, is you know liberty and, and justice, the, liberty and freedoms. It's very scary, especially giving it to a child. Um, and I mean, there's the possibilities of what what could their identity be if they weren't trapped in this institution, right? Learning, learning, right? Uh, you know from nine to three every single day. But then there's, you know, I, I don't I don't know if I, I've never had trust in, in society enough to like be willing to 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 want to see what that would look like. I don't think it's going to be Lord of the Flies, but I mean, I don't, I've never trusted. I, 
would argue that schooling is fundamental to our society, right? Like it's, you know, our society is very much shaped by schooling. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have any kids or anything, but um, yeah, it seems to me at school, I like what you're saying there, Mac, and then, but the, yeah, the, what you're just saying, Antonio, it seems like, you know, well, the school, and as mentioned in the, in the chat here, school is part and parcel to like training you to work eight to five, right? School is kind of like preschool for having a standard 40 hour work, 40 hour a week job. But I think then the other side of that though is asking the question, and I think this is always the question I've asked, like, well, what is, what can be, what is salvageable from school? Or like maybe uh, I think what Sarah was saying is like, what does education look like uh, outside of a school? And I think there's lots of ways. I mean, I'll be the first one to say school is, you know, a course of institution that sucks. And, you know, Foucault is the one who says, you know, is it any wonder that schools look like prisons, which looks like hospitals, which looks like schools, which look like prisons, right? Like institutions are fundamentally coercive and, and social, about social control, social manipulation. And, but there's still like, I think, you know, and I, I would say even higher ed is like there's a lot of problems there as someone who's in it. Um, but like cer certainly there are like things that are useful from the socialization aspect, you know, how to deal with people, how to work out interpersonal relationships, how to navigate conflict. Um, you know, you, you show the headline, the newspaper thing that said like suspensions went down like 99% or whatever during lockdown, uh, which I think is what that was from, which of course makes sense, right? If you're at home all day and you're not interacting with people in a, and actually in person, there's going to be less, uh, conflict like that almost seems like uh, that doesn't seem like an unreasonable thing to imagine but the reality is is like we don't exist in a society or well, at least most of us aren't able to exist like in our home all the time separate from different people right people with different experiences and different backgrounds and sometimes that means conflict breaks out and the question is how do we cultivate the skills to navigate that which doesn't result in violence you know in whatever that may be either physical or verbal and so I guess what I'm trying to say is there are instances where settings that put kids in situations where they have to interact with people that they don't know is actually might be a good thing for like the overall development of society. If you want to think about society as like, again, like this collection of individuals who maybe didn't choose to be here, but nonetheless have to coexist, right? So anyway. Can, can I jump in real quick? I, I actually, um slightly disagree with that. I think the suspensions went down because they weren't in school and they didn't have to comply all day to what the adults were asking them. Um, and I, I think if kids had the freedom to, um, you know, do what they would like to do in school and pick the classes that they want to go to, they would get along with, with kids and their teachers much better. Um, I, I think the suspension thing has to, has more to do with you didn't do what you were told, so now we're, you're out of here. Where when you're not at school um, and having to deal with the teachers, I I can see how suspensions like weren't there anymore. I don't know. Yeah, and I would just add that no one I don't think uh, any anyone in the school abolition community or in that discussion, no one's suggesting that um, children be isolated and, and bereft of opportunity to engage in that way that you were describing and to solve problems and interact and figure out to be humans together. In fact, that's, uh, as a person who um, co-leads a self-directed education community, I mean, that's literally what happens all day long. Um, the kids are figuring out and we along with them are figuring out how to be human together. Um, so I just wanna make sure that piece is in there. The, it's, not, it's not binary, a, a lack of schooling doesn't mean that um, then also there's a lack of socialization. I wanna kind of jump back briefly to what Mac brought up earlier of like uh, not feeling trustful um, I definitely shared that when like first hearing about this uh, in like theoretical context. Um, 
and I, I gained a lot more comfort with it by visiting uh, self-directed education, like schools or centers or alternatives to school. A lot of towns have like a democratic free schools or things, you know, they're kind of adjacent to that where you get to, if they're open to visitors, you have a chance to like meet kids who are growing up in an environment that's wildly different from the conventional paradigm. Um, uh, you know, we, we are fortunate in the schooling uh, option that there are at least some small examples where you can go get a taste of the alternative, whereas with policing, it's sort of ubiquitous. That's a great point. And I think with policing, there are there are places you can go, but you have typically need to have a lot of money, right? Like there are communities where police are non-existent, right? But they're they're rich communities, right? And the purpose of police isn't to police those communities. I suppose to some degree, like a gated neighborhood is functionally that, or those like rich enclaves, um, interesting. Antonio, you're so right. Uh, you know, I. I grew up in the Bronx, and now that I live in uh, Northern Virginia, the con and I have a I have a black son. So like I try to tell him as I'm, as I as I'm trying to raise him and, and teach him certain things, how to con conduct himself. Like he looks at me like I'm crazy because, you know, the threats that I'm telling him may exist, they don't exist in Virginia because as you say, uh, they police here differently, right? I mean, I rarely ever see a cop, um, in the suburbs here than uh, versus other neighborhoods. But um, one of the benefits of school um, is, is, is like just to leave your own culture and leave that family, because you know, we're, not, we're not even abolished because there, there are things that happen in the homes, right? There are certain aspects of, of my immigrant culture that I needed to divorce that just weren't, weren't cool, right? And I got to do that by seeing a contrast at school, right? So it's good that there's, that no one's saying to abolish education because, you know, um, I guess if there were no schools, we'd have, we'd have to be doing something, but um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I, I think that like the whole abolitionist argument, particularly um, as it's applied to the prison industrial complex is that the goal isn't just to get rid of the police and prisons, it's to address like the ways in which we perpetuate harm or the ways that we're complicit in it, right? And it's just um, like, how do we improve our relationships with one another? How do we um, engage in conflict resolution? How do we recognize our own toxic behaviors that impact other people? And, and you know, there, I think that there's a lot to be said for schools contribute so much harm to children and society that it's worth getting rid of them, irrespective of what else is out there. Um, but, but most people also wanna change the way in which we have relationships with kids. I, I don't know of anyone who is like really into self-directed education, at least like a, from a, well, I do actually. So I take that back. Um, there are certain unschoolers who, are, who, who can be really problematic. Um, but, um, but the unschoolers who are typically associated with, you know, more liberatory uh, efforts, you know, the reason they unschool is, is uh, in support of liberation as opposed to just get their kids ahead. Um, and, and, you know, most of the self-directed education communities that I've been involved with, you know, a, a fundamental part of of what they do and why they do it is to change the way in which young people get to relate to the world and the way in which they're treated by other human beings and, and to help them um, to help them understand that so that they can be a, a better human being to others, uh, to their communities and whatnot. And so um, one of the big arguments, for example, during the lockdown that a lot of people had was you know, kids are safer in school than they are at home, right? Which, you know, that framing is super problematic <laughs> from the get-go. Um, you know, there's a lot, a lot baked into it. But, 
but yeah, I would say that in this society where we're all schooled and we've been all uh, subjected to various forms of violence, some violence, you know, really heavy and other people are dealing with, you know, lighter forms of violence, et cetera, but we're all uh, conditioned by the society that we live in and we all have things that we need to work on. Um, you know, I, I do think that that's something that all children benefit from, um, but but I personally don't see school as a healthy environment to get those things. I, th I think that, you know, it's certainly good to have like a diversity of experiences and whatnot, but I think that all of those experiences can be done in much more healthy environments than schools personally. I think the flying squads, which you mentioned earlier, are like a really interesting example of that because they're, they're these uh, groups of uh, typically uh, groups of maybe what, eight or 10 kids with a facilitator that like roam around town and kind of figure out what they're going to do each day interacting with the cityscape. Um, one, it's like it, it doesn't even have a building, so it's very obviously not school. Um, but two, you're getting like a much more interesting avenue for engaging with the wider world because you're you know you're not just meeting other people of your same age at school in this like sterile environment you're meeting people at their jobs uh, you're meeting adults you're meeting old folks you're meeting people at the park you, you're getting like such a, a vastly richer exposure experience and they like literally they just meet up at a park and like walk around <laughs> It's like, so, I don't know. I think it's kind of an interesting point of contrast of like, once you step outside of school, there's a lot of actually kind of easy things that if that's the goal, there, you know, there are other, other ways to get there. We're, we're running out of time. I did want to, there's a lot of good quotes in here, really good quotes um, that we just can't touch, but I did want to highlight just a couple before we go. It is actually kindergarten and the obligatory education of K-12 where Illich's uh, point is most clearly made that school is a, if not the primary site for the reproduction of oppression and inequality. School became the first in a series of institutions that train individuals to become clients rather than autonomous agents. And I do think that schools are very powerful. There's a reason why every state <laughs> wants to control um, schools right and why it's united states and a couple other places are very rare and that people can even have an option to opt out of schooling um, because it's so powerful in bringing people into um you know this belief or trust of authority and hierarchy and and the idea that some people deserve certain types of violence um, applied to them and then um i know that we, you know, we don't have enough time to really dive into like, you know, what are we going to do without schools? Um, like, what are the alternatives? You know, how do we, how do we deal with childcare and whatnot? But there's a couple quotes in here. Um, and I saved this for the school abolition piece, even though they're writing about prison abolition, you know, it's just like talking about how we have to create all these alternatives. We actually need to go out and provide um, alternatives to prisons and policing and schools. The great thing about school abolition is it's a lot easier to create an alternative to school than it is to create an alternative to police. Um, at least currently, you know, you're, you're unlikely to, uh, you know, have, you know, the FBI, like, try to frame you on crimes for opting out of schooling, whereas if you opt out of, out of the others, you know, it's, it's a lot more challenging. Um, and then Miriam Kaba talks about the importance of building a million different little experiments. And I see that as something that every unschooler and every self-directed education community is participating in. Um, I don't see uh, unschooling or democratic schools um, or these other iterations of, of self-directed education as like a threat to what, like what I'm doing. I see uh, myself um, and like a brome in Austin as contributing to, you know, 
these million different experiments that can show people what's possible, um, that can show people that, that, you know, kids deserve to have control over their time and minds and bodies. And this is just my thing because I'm so frustrated by so many abolitionists who, uh, you know, um, think that schooling, that we need to fund schooling and we need to support schooling um, or that schooling can be the vehicle through which we can create this mass education that can lead to uh, pick uh, abolition, right? So I just, I don't believe that schooling should be considered part of the abolitionist framework. Um, uh, I don't, I think that everything that the schools do that are seen as valuable um, can be done outside of schooling. So feeding people, feeding kids, um, like that's something that if we did that outside of school, one is, you know, you probably have better quality because you don't have these monopolies that, you know, get, you know, these special relationships with corporations. But two is you can reach more people, right? Like, what, what are you supposed to do as a kid before the age of five, right? You know, like feed them too. And how about people who are hungry after the age of 18? Well, let's feed them as well, right? Um, do people need support with childcare just after their kid turns five, right? And I know that a lot of people are pushing like universal pre-K and whatnot, but like, you know, childcare, that's another thing. We don't need to have schools to have childcare. And you know, families who don't want their kids subjected to schooling or who are pushed out of schooling, they deserve childcare as well. And so I really don't see anything that schools do that can't be done outside of the institution of schooling, um, you know, where it's optional and it can reach more people. That's my personal view. And I had to throw down my own quote, but I just wanted to drive that point home. <laughs> um, so it's four o'clock. So has anyone changed their mind on anything or does anyone have a really um, insightful question that has arisen that maybe we can leave and think about? I think we should all uh, work on our one of the million, at least thinking about what, what the alternatives might look like because we're gonna, you know, I think that's a, not only is it something that has to happen ab after abolition, but I think it's actually a precondition because so many uh, are stuck like me on uh, inability to imagine the alternatives and the sooner we can show people what might work, um, the, the more likely I think it is to happen. I'm wondering if you have a list of books that you like the quotes came from, if there was something like that that could be shared. I, I can certainly give a, um, a list that, that has a source for every quote, except for that last one. <laughs> I'll send that to you. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for joining and thanks Alder Commons for um, hosting this space. I appreciate it. It was a good conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Antonio. It was, thank uh, you, Antonio. Wonderful yeah. to have you here.